everyone. Good morning and welcome back to the Performance Cafe. And today we have another Sadar team member for a Coffee Companion. We're going to be so well versed in this topic, but I'm loving the series because we're on our fourth Sadar interview and we've learned so much from everyone that's been here before. This morning, we're joined by Tim Holmes. Tim is the senior partner, head of sales of Sadar Group, and he's born and bred in England and came to South Africa in 1992 and worked in various IT-related businesses in the investment industry until joining Sadar in 2013. He's a director, mentor, speaker, and a trained Demartini method fa uh, facilitator and a leader in the education and implementation of governance in businesses of all sizes. Tim is passionate about rapidly growing privately held businesses and making a meaningful economic impact in South Africa and the rest of the continent. He's currently independent chairman of We Think Code and IWMS SA, India and USA. And on that note, welcome, Tim. Hi, welcome. It's good to be here. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to have you here with us. And uh, I'm so excited. It seems like every time I speak to someone at Sadar, I get a whole new world, a whole new perspective. So we are learning a ton from all of you. Um, Great. And so, Tim, I, I have to ask you my standard question first, and that is around performance. Performance and success, if you want to. How do you think we currently describe performance and success? Yeah, largely, it seems to be based on financial results. Whereas I don't think we are including enough of the other kind, the other parts of the other stakeholders that we impact and the other aspects that we need to perform at as well. So we can see it in the news. We can see it in what's happening with COVID. We can see it in, in our reaction to, and to how we've, we measure ourselves and measure our success that we're not looking enough at how we help others. We're not looking enough at how we, have an impact on the environment. We just look at performance as being did shareholders get a good return on investment, and that's been the case for for millennia. Um, but I think we we have to move as as humans into a point where we we're considering a lot more performance aspects than we we typically would in the past. And where do you think we would need to start? Is there a such a place as an ideal starting point? Look, in an organizational context, it has to start at the top, which means it has to start on the board. Uh, and that's been my journey over the last eight years with Sirdar is to try and convince people that they have to be leaders in that space. It's not just a tick, tick box compliance exercise. It's actually taking leadership, actually understanding what the impact is of your organization on the community and, and the country and the world at large. And taking responsibility for that um, and the laws also change to help and support the, the accountability um, although it seems to take a heck of a long time to actually convict anybody of any wrongdoing at, at that level and that's something that we can't really control um, but it's it's become there's, there's a lot more awareness i think that the role of being a director is far more influential and far more responsible than than people once thought um, and there's pers there's impact personally, financially as well as, as the impact you have on the organization as a whole. Mm -hmm. So let's start, you talk about organization. Now mm. to me, I, I immediately assume corporate, huge and large. Yeah. But we've also had a very interesting discussion between an entrepreneur that builds a business and an entrepreneur that maintains almost what he has tell, tell me a bit more about that and how does that look from the boardroom perspective it's something we spoke a, a lot about six seven eight years ago and in fact that the carl was having these conversations when i first met him 15 years ago 10 years ago and and there's there's a distinct difference between a business that's built based on craft concepts and one that's built based on enterprise concepts so they're both entrepreneurial journeys, but they end up at completely different destinations. So we've been, we've been running and building craft businesses again for hundreds of years because that's how a baker starts and that's how a, a cobbler starts and a, a, mm -hmm. some making beer in their little shack in the tiny village in England somewhere where someone learns a skill 
they become good and proficient at that skill and they build a business based on that skill. But what they tend to do is become a better baker or make better beer or build better buildings. They don't build a better business. So they, the, the whole business in their mind, they're thinking it's a business is really just a job. And they're just getting better and better at their job. And they're employing people below them that support them to do a better job. But if you take that individual, that master craftsman out of that organization, then it just starts, it just falls apart very quickly, completely or gradually. But eventually it starts to die because the, the energy, the force that's driving it has been removed and there's nothing else to replace it. There's no organizational structure to replace it. So that could be five people, it could be 50 people, it could be 500 people. If, if the business is built on that individual, then really it's it, the, the size of the business is, is entirely based on the capacity of that individual. And some businesses grow to significant size and some businesses don't. The majority stay quite small, less than 10 employees. What, uh, what I was talking about, I think, when in our conversation earlier about it being a T-junction is if you go down the route of a craft, you are developing yourself. You're not de necessarily developing others and you're not building a team. If you go the enterprise route, from the very first moment, it's, well, who am I going to employ next? Who's going to add to the team, not who's going to support me in my, my role and be doing better at what I'm doing necessarily. So you, if I'm really rubbish at admin, I have to get someone in who's going to take that away so I can focus on what I'm better at. And if I'm not very good at marketing, I have to get someone who's much, much better than me at marketing to do that role. So it's always employing someone ideally that's better than you. Whereas mm -hmm. the master crafts mindset is only I can do it. And I'm, if, if I'm going to get it done properly, then I must do it myself. You know, you hear that mm -hmm. language all the time and that's very much that sort of craft mindset. Okay. If I want to get it done, I have to do it. And as soon as someone says that they're on the rock, they're on a specific track, but they need to understand that's the track they're on and need to understand that they must put their, the money they earn into other assets because the business isn't an asset. Whereas if they're building a team, they take themselves out. Mm -hmm. They've built an organization that has processes. It has built in IP. Everything's documented. Again, it could be 10 people. It could be 100 people, but it's the way it's set up. So if the founder's not there for three months, the business doesn't just fall Shouldn't apart matter. because everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. They know what their roles and responsibilities are. They are good at their jobs and they just get on mm. with it. And, mm. and often if the founder is sort of holding things back, it, it helps if they're not there for a few months, the business has an <laughs> to grow even faster. I don't think we're supposed to tell them that, Tim. No, <laughs> I don't think you're wrong, but I don't think we're supposed to tell them that. <laughs> so, this, this is fascinating. So here we're talking, it seems to me, about a mindset. Are certain people more prone to having the right mind, the mindset or the skills or the aptitudes and capabilities to build a business or to build the enterprise, let's call it that way? Now, I don't want to be ageist, but I think just naturally as younger people, we tend to think we are immortal and invincible and we know everything. You can see it in our kids. Mm -hmm. They know everything by the time they're 13. And it takes a long time before they realize they don't. And we're, we're no different as entrepreneurs because we're really good at this thing that we do and we, we're passionate about this thing and our product and service is amazing and must tell the world. We're, not, we're, we're going forward with that kind of mindset and not actively looking to learn from others and spend money on getting help so mm -hmm. there's, there's, I, I'm convinced that there's this massive plateau of a lump of people, whatever the word is, lumps, wrong, wrong connotation, but there's a whole <laughs> bunch of thousands of businesses that have grown up to a point, but they just can't grow anymore because they're, way of, they're constructed. And because the, smaller, the small businesses don't spend money on getting help, they never mm -hmm. quite make the shift. Whereas corporates... Mm -hmm do this all the time. They spend thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of rands and dollars on getting help so they can do something better. But the, even spending a smaller amount that's relative to your revenue 
as a smaller business, we think we have to do it ourselves all the time. And we have to learn how to do something ourselves all the time. We don't get help from someone else or outsource something or all those kind of things. We, we, we hold on too tight. And only mm. if we let go and start, as I said, building a team, can we nearly really take it to the next level. So the reason for my question was, my, my sense is, so for example, I am not the person that's based at admin. I am not the person, I want to just go out and solve the client's problem. I don't mm. want to have to put a thousand processes in the pla in place. Um, I want to enjoy the, you know, the, the back and forth that I have with clients, that kind of thing. I sometimes wonder, is my personality the kind of personality that's less likely to build an enterprise? Because I'm solution focused. I'm not thinking about how am I going to secure this business and get the information out of my head onto a piece of paper. And I'm not hiring a, a lot of people to help me. Is that a, can that be a personality thing? Yeah, it can be. And we use a, we use a tool called Contribution Compass. And the, the profile of Champion is very much about building a brand and and getting recognition and, and taking something forward as an individual. So you want mm. to be seen and you want to be heard and you've got a message to give. Now that can mm. either be used as a marketing thing for a bigger organization or it can be mm. used in the craft concept. So it's, it ends up being down to the individual about what they want okay. to build. What is their goal? So we, the name Sirdar comes from the lead Sherpa on a mountain expedition. It's about you deciding how big a mountain do you want to climb. Not everybody wants to climb Everest. But if you do want to climb Everest, you need some help. You need a team. You need the right um, training and support and equipment mm -hmm. and all the rest of it to achieve that goal. So as an individual, if you're happy to be the focus and do something on your own. So lots of you know, small consulting practices, accounting firms, all of those kind of things can be really, really successful crafts. But it's a different kind of business. So if a dentist decides they want to be a, the best that they can be and they have a small practice and everybody comes to them, you know, destination dentist for crowns or whatever it is, fantastic. They'll make lots of money doing that, but they won't be able to sell the business. So they need to put the money aside into property, into shares, into whatever else to make sure they've got something to retire on. If they think, no, I want to build a business that's bigger than me, then I have to bring in other people. I need to bring in other experts. I might build a clinic etc. It's a different outcome. I can still be a specialist, but I'm within a different organizational structure. And it's not all about me. I'm just a piece of the puzzle. So it's, it's, it's again, it's, it's that shift. But, it, but the personality does definitely start with personality type because particular personalities want to be front and center, want to be the center mm -hmm. of attention, and, and will mm -hmm. tend to you know, go off in that craft, on that craft journey. Wonderful. So if a champion like myself then decides one day, okay, hold on, I want a business that I can sell, is all lost? No, you need to find other champions that can carry the load. So Sirdar been through this, has been, been struggling with this transition for some time. And, and, and it's interesting that you've spoken to is it four, of, four of us so far. No, no, I, didn't, I had to speak to Carl twice because between the two okay. of us, we so, couldn't actually get everything so Carl, done in one session. So Carl is our founder and he is very much a champion profile and has led the business from the front for a long time. But for mm. the business to be a saleable asset, he had to bring in other people. So I was the first one he brought in. Now we've got Bevin, we've got various other people in the leadership team that are heading up the different divisions because we need to take it to the next level with a team. We can't do it all with Carl. So that's, that was a very, very difficult and still is a difficult transition um, because he's damn good at what he does and has got a lot of experience and, and carries the message very well. So you, we may not ever get there perfectly. Um, we hope we do. But, but that's the danger is you've, mm -hmm. if you've got that really strong brand champion out there, it's mm -hmm. quite difficult to replace them because they are unique and they are unique in the market. Um, so yes, it, it, it may not be possible if the business is built on a brand champion, um, but it's something you at least need to strive to achieve and systemize and get things out of that person's head and build a process so that two people can do that bit, whereas before it was only one, et cetera. 
Okay. So I have to then throw at you the typical excuse all small businesses have. We don't have money to hire people. Tim, how yes. am I supposed to change my thinking? I don't have money to hire people. Now what? Well, I was actually reading a book yesterday that talked through exactly the example that we try and use as often as possible. So if you work out how much you can earn. So if you do another one of these um, uh, podcasts, how much... Revenue recognition, whatever does it generate? So if you free up an hour of your week so that you can do more podcasts or more consulting or more whatever, how much is that worth to you? You now have a budget for the person to bring in your organization who can take that hour or give you that hour back. And if it's admin that's driving you crazy, then find an outsourced admin clerk to come and do your admin for two or three hours or half a day a week or whatever it might be. And then use that time. Don't waste it. Use that time you've now freed up to focus more on what you're good at. So it's that whole 80-20% rule. If we're not spending 80% of our time doing the stuff that generates the revenue, then how on earth are we going to get there? If we're still stuck at 20 or 10% of our time doing the stuff that actually generates revenue, then we're going to constantly be in this battle of income not coming in and not being able to grow and all the rest of it. So it's, it's, it's that conscious and deliberate shift. But the best way, to, as, as I said, the best way to work out a budget is, well, if I can earn a thousand rand an hour doing something, then who can I pay a thousand rand to to give me another hour? Yes. Yes. And if you don't make that shift, you will have to do everything forever. And, and interestingly enough, not only that, because I do love your example, being a consultant, I think in what does an hour cost me? So, mm. for example, you know, people say, oh, you know, you pay so much for, let's say, a garden or something. I go, do you know what else I could do in that time and not ruin my yeah. nails? But that's another story entirely. Let's not go down <laughs> that rabbit hole. Um, so what I, what I also think, and, and I'd like to hear your opinion on this, is wanting to do everything ourselves is an incredibly expensive mistake from an energy level because we're also doing mm. things that we don't like. How do you feel about that? Um, no, I hate doing, doing things I don't like. It definitely drains <laughs> my energy. <laughs> and I've been on that personal journey multiple times in the last few years of trying to shed myself of the stuff that I don't need to do so I can focus more on the sales stuff mm -hmm. and the facilitation and webinars and talks and all the other stuff that I enjoy and, and also adds a lot more value. Um, so yes, it's a constant battle. We've used timesheet systems and uh, all kinds of things to try and monitor how much time we're not so much wasting, but spending doing things we shouldn't be doing. And we did a, a massive drive uh, just before lockdown, actually, and, and continued it during, during the last year of trying to encourage everyone in the team to, to use a simple online tool to monitor how much time am I spending with particular clients? How much of my time am I spending on just reading emails? You know, it's to, to focus your day down to, if I haven't got all my emails done by whenever it is I'm going to do them in the day, by 9, 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock in the morning, I have to stop and then I have to do something else. I can't just keep going and then suddenly it's lunchtime and, oh, I haven't done anything real work. Okay. So it's a constant battle for all levels of the organization to what is the, what is the thing I'm supposed to be doing that generates the most revenue or profit for the company and focus on mm -hmm. doing that and then try and make sure I spend as little time as possible, not ignoring it completely, but try and delegate yes. it or manage it more effectively or be more structured or whatever mm -hmm. to, to do it more efficiently. Because that what? social media, I mean, these, these things are massive time killers. I hardly ever look at Facebook anymore. Just, I just yeah. don't. I don't have time. Yeah. You know, I've got more important things to do. I'd rather read a book than tr flick through Facebook. Yes, and wonder where the content comes from. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, I don't have to verify what's in the book. The author's name is on it. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. In the world of large corporates and boards, where you guys thrive, what do you think is going to happen to the concept of a large company or corporate in the future? Will we still have these behemoths forever? 
Um, we will have some, but already we're seeing that there are less and less of them because smaller companies are more agile, they're more innovative, um, the bigger companies are being left behind in lots of industries. I think for, for something that's capital intensive, it's difficult to get away without with having a big company. And we can see that I was watching a, a documentary yesterday about vaccines. Pfizer is a massive company. If they hadn't been a massive company with unlimited budget for developing a vaccine, they wouldn't have got their vaccine out as quickly as they did. Other institutions did it different ways, but that's how they achieved what they needed to achieve because they were a big company and they had the resources to do it. And there are other examples. I mean, you can't have power generation without a big organization. It's difficult to build super tankers without having a big organization because there's so much capital in infrastructure mining. You have to have massive amounts of money invested to be able to do it efficiently and effectively and, and get a margin on it. So there's, there's going to be places where we will always have big organizations unless the product or service changes fundamentally. And there will be areas where like consulting and accounting and those kind of things used to be always big organizations. I mean, growing up, I, you, I didn't know anybody that was a small accountant. You went and worked for the big accounting firm and you usually went to London to do the big accounting firm stuff or the big legal firm stuff. It was just the solicitor on their own, a little tiny office that would maybe help you transfer the, your house deeds or something. But that, they've, they've become much more specialists who are in much smaller teams or they're on uh, much more flexible arrangements. Um, so there's already happening that the bigger businesses are starting to get smaller and sometimes drastically smaller. But I, I really don't think we'll ever be able to do without the big corporations for the big capital intensive and, and people intensive kind of operations.